Yeah. But they, uh, they do, yeah, they do, they do record them, so. Yeah. I guess it's like Ray said, we shouldn't really be afraid to talk in front of men, we're talking in front of God, you know. <coughs> Even though we are, we're flesh too, so. I think this thing is recording now. Before God, um, it's not just words that are recorded, it's thoughts and intents besides. Yeah. You know, so, so talk, well, I think yeah. that's recording already. Mm -hmm. It's still yep. recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Like you want to put something soft under it, so when you scratch at the table, it bumps it. Kind of move that sound. Okay. You got good quality to pick up normal voice from across here. It should be as good or better than the first one. I don't know how it was set up. Held like hands. I held it. <laughs> oh, I think if you just put it forward, the mic. It, that's the mic. Yeah, that yeah. that's supposed to receive. There's I'll I'll try and move it wherever people talk if I can. Do it. There should be settings on there too. Mine has settings where you can do A B C D settings, and it it um, intensifies it or or gives you more more data available data if you have it real intense. It decreases your hours of recording from 40 to 250. So I don't know if you got it on the best setting, but it's on a, probably on a good setting. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. I make a motion. We start with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before your heart of love with all of our concerns and with all of our thoughts. And yes, dear Father, in a little way, we are beginning to understand that you are a God and Father whom can, who does your will, and we as poor men here and as poor children here, we desire to understand and to know your will through your word. And there are doctrines and teachings in your word that men would become partakers of salvation through this, your son whom you have sent. There are teachings in your word for a walk of sanctification. And dear Father, we experience in our time and even in our midst that your word can be understood in so many ways. But dear Father, we know that there is one way of truth and one way of righteousness. And we pray, dear Father, that by your spirit, even as we have gathered here to discuss the matters of your word and how it is taught and how it is spoken and how the board should determine and how, it, how it, they would uphold those who speak the truth. We ask, Father, that you would so give light and understanding and wisdom and knowledge in these matters. And even as we discuss them tonight, we know that you have a heart and a word that would want that hearts would be united and drawn together and the different gifts that you give men to speak the different members of the body of Christ that you would even grant and allow that they could be used amongst us that there could be a unity of spirit and heart and mind as we journey here for we do not want to separate people or divide people or anything like that. But we pray that your heart would so be opened to us even this night and to our congregation, both young and old, and wherever your word is spoken, dear Father, that your open heart of love through Jesus Christ and the grace that you have towards sinner man would be made known in your complete word, the law and the gospel. 
So bless our gathering this night, dear Father, and do direct us and grant each and every one light and wisdom and understanding in all of the matters that we will discuss. Bless our, bless our little flock and our little gathering here, Father. Now we come before you with that prayer, which is a perfect prayer. He who has, he who has redeemed us with his own life and with his own blood. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Would it be all right if Brian starts again, as he did the last one? Since no, that was everybody the knows what I said. Other people can talk. Hmm? I guess whoever has the accusations is about Steve, right? I suppose questions should be asked or something to begin with yes i agree with you paul I mean, we have to start somewhere when it just he just doesn't stand up and say well i hear this or i hear that it has to be said yes there's other people here too i want to hear other people talk too well you so are far it's been brian it's and it hasn't been i've talked to many people a lot of them are here speak up Evidently, you're a spokesman for many. Mm -hmm. well, I just thought you had a good summary last time. Some concerns and all that, that, that would be good then. I heard the accusations. And, if, and to address them, I suppose I can. Yeah. Be good. As well. Study God's word here. I have two things on my heart, primarily. And the first is that right doctrine would be retained among us. And also that unity would be retained among us. Those two things are critical. It seems in listening to uh, the accusations that they boil down to original sin, confession and absolution, and the election and predestination, those, those questions. And I can, uh, speak of those matters. I don't hold any new understanding on them. They're just the doctrines that have been taught in our church from the apostolic times. And some of the things that have been spoken, especially in the time of the Reformation, were very commonly heard concerning original sin and the state of the race of Adam after the fall. And as was read in that meeting where Luther in his baptismal liturgy, when a baptism was performed, that people heard that Without a doubt, this child is possessed of the devil in original sin. And in sermons, it was commonly heard, things of that nature, the nature of man after the fall. And for some reason, it, it wasn't offensive. And I wonder if it's because there was then a more firm grip on the gospel and the power of God to save through the word. I don't know. When I preach, I desire to speak from the heart, not from my head. And I would like to bring out matters of truth and preach from the heart and not offend ears if God would allow. 
but yet preach the truth and preach from my heart and not my head. That's my desire. It certainly isn't my intent to speak anything uh, expecting any certain result in the congregation except awakening, repentance, and faith. And since I don't preach anything new on these matters, then I'm only preaching the things that I've learned in Sunday school. And so that if there should ever be any question as to what I believe, teach, and confess, I'll simply go back to what I learned in Sunday school. So in addressing original sin, I learned in Sunday school, in the second article of the Creed, that Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done so that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns in all eternity. And I recited this even when I was confirmed in this faith. This is most certainly true. And I believed it when I was confirmed. And today I believe it, that according to my natural birth, I was even as is said here, a creature, lost and condemned, under the power of sins, death, the power of the devil. But redemption came to me, as I learned in this second article, by Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. That word that was sent from heaven came unto me, a lost and condemned creature, and worked faith in my heart to draw me to Christ to preach to me forgiveness of sins and the blessings that come through that redemptive work. I cannot deny, and I will never say, that I was born a good person. I was born a sinner. We were all born sinners. We are all, according to the flesh, born with sin. And that sin puts us under the power of death. And we see that for we all must die. Who has escaped? the sin nature and the effect of sin, none. We have funerals here, and we can see there the effect of sin. Has anyone born escaped the effect of the sin nature? None. And, and I believe, as is written here, the effect of the sin nature is death and the power of the devil. But beautifully, as it's written here, along with that, we learn the gospel and hear the gospel. That through the sacrifice of Christ, sins are forgiven and man is redeemed and granted new life. So I'm not sure what other people heard in Sunday school, but I found that I was a lost and condemned preacher according to my carnal birth. Scripture testifies of that also, that in Adam, all die. In Adam, we were thrust from the garden. In Christ, we are made alive. In Christ, we are united again with that God who thrust us from the garden. And that matter doesn't just happen with a, a wave of the bond in heaven with no work on earth, but these matters come through the means of grace, where God sends the preached word to his people on earth, and all who hear live and are saved.
there is a means of grace to draw these lost sinners unto God. The Catechism is uh, reaffirmed by the Augsburg Confession, which is uh, the doctrine of this church. And if there's any question as to what I believe, I can't put it any better than is written here, than our church fathers in the time of the Reformation and also our church fathers when the Apostolic Lutheran Church was established in America, stated and gave us these words, these doctrines, First of all, so that there would be no schism between the Lutheran Church in Finland and Sweden and the church here. They gave us the Lutheran confessions, and this is written in the bylaws of our church. They had respect to what Rathama said, desiring that we would remain with those teachings that Lestadius and Leitinen preached and in that church which they administered the sacraments. So we have as the doctrine of our church concerning the fall. They also they teach that since the fall of Adam, all men begotten according to nature are born with sin. That this, that is without the fear of God, without trust in God, and with concupiscence. And that this disease or vice of origin is truly sin, even now condemning and bringing eternal death upon those not born again through baptism and the Holy Ghost. They condemn the Pelagians and others who deny that the vice of origin is sin and who to obscure the glory of Christ's merit and benefits argue that man can be justified before God by his own reason and strength. but I don't know that in our discussion that there was any problem with what is said what you said I think it was brought up that um, you've many times from the pulpit made the statement that the law is just to reveal original sin I've uh, probably never said that and I don't hold that understanding I've said the primary purpose of the law is, but there are certainly other uses of the law. Yeah, because Luther definitely speaks yeah. of it. And we've discussed that, but I've never heard that preached that way. The main focus that it's only on original sin, I think that's for people, okay, is that all the purpose it is? Because that's the main thrust. It's been spoken for quite a while. When original sin is known, then the actual sins that proceed from original sin will also become mm -hmm. evident by that same law. So do we preach it that way or do we just talk it that way? I hope so. Yeah. How did you just say that? You got a recorder right there. Well, so, you said from knowing original sin, then you get to know your actual sins? Right, that the original sin is the root of all actual sin. That's not the way it was for me. I tried to put away actual sins. Tried and tried and tried tried until God revealed to me that you know what you're not going to be able to put away all your sins to get to heaven because you are sin because you have original sin it was revealed the other way to me that's what, but what you're saying is what I'm saying original sin is the cause of all those actual sins yeah and what, you what, said original what it, sin reveals actual sin but it's the other way around I didn't it's the root of actual sin and the law reveals actual and original the same law. And I would also address one more thing. It was said that I say children are of the devil. Born of the devil. Or born of the devil. Yeah. Well, the recording says children are of the devil. Born of the devil. I don't teach that. I don't know where this wording comes from. I have said that 
the children of Adam are born under the power of the devil because of our concupiscence and original sin. But not born of the devil, not of the devil. And I'm afraid that at this point, as much as this has been discussed, if people bring the accusation and state that children are born of the devil, according to what I teach, that they're bearing false witness for the purpose of inciting people to a dissension. And, that, and that's, that's not good. We should be careful in the accusations we bring and make sure they're I, accurate. I, I agree with you. And the, the accusation on the recording is extremely inaccurate. So you say you've never said that? That children, children are, are born children of the devil? Are born children of the devil. If it was said in that, set, in that, well, those exact words with it was the fact that because of sin, they are in the devil's kingdom. But to give it the sense that children are somehow proceed from the devil or the devil gives life or, or whatever is, is absolutely false. God is the giver of life. God creates children and he uses a corrupt seed. Go to the back first. And then the <clears throat> I'm just wondering why? Why do you? Why, why did you make the statement like that? Though? Like what? What point were you trying to drive home? Talking about if the children are born, you know, maybe not born of the devil, but born, or however you said at home, under the what, power. What, of the devil. Yeah. What were you? What, what are you driving at when you say that? When you said that? I'm not sure what you're asking. What are you driving at? What's the what was the whole point of the that statement? I mean, I've heard the statement too that it was you know that you've said that, and so I want to know what were you driving at with it? What were you, what point okay, were you what, trying what to make? What statement specifically are you referring? The to? statement of children are born uh, of the devil, or however you. No, they're uh, not born of the devil. Or how you put it, though. I mean, under the power of. Under the power of the devil. Okay, there you go. How, what, what point were you driving at with that? The point I'm driving at is that without knowing our corruption, without knowing the power of the enemy of our soul, we can never come to know Christ in his fullness. We can, if we don't know the bondage we are in, the power that Satan has over us according to our natural birth because of the sin that is in our flesh, we will never come to know the Redeemer. We'll never come to know a deliverer, a savior. We'll, we'll, have, we'll end up with a religion and a patchwork and a Jesus who helps us along the way, but not a savior in, in whose redemption we can rejoice. We must know the power of sin and Satan in order to comprehend the gospel. I was just going to uh, affirm what Bud said that the correct order, Bud did lay out the correct order, and that's according to Romans 7. Um, the apostle says, I had not known um, uh, lost except the, the commandment, say thou shalt not covet. Uh, so the only way that a person even begins to fathom his, his sins and then his sin and then you know, the vice of origin is by being exposed to God's commandments. Like Bud laid out, he was exposed to you know, what he was doing, the commandment was slaying him. And, and, and the more he tried to wrestle against it, the more uh, helpless and hopeless he felt, and, and we've experienced that. I know what that means, too. And um, another good example is when Jesus told that young man um, that came up to him desiring eternal life, uh, Jesus didn't go and say, contemplate um, original sin or some deep thing. He told him, go and do the commandments. You know the commandments? Go and do them. Moreover, if you'll be perfect, go and sell what you have and um, and um, I give to the poor and come and follow me. Like he gave him something to do, knowing that that doing would exhaust him of all his efforts. So hopeless and helpless, he'd have to throw up his hands. If he were honest with himself, he'd have to throw up his hands and say, I'm down. I can't do this. Now, going back to some of the original points you've been making, that's only what you're saying is only half of the equation. Uh, the original sin and the reef in the Psalms, a little bit of what David understood. Because it's not enough to say half of the equation. That is why a lot of people are confused. 
in Psalm 51, um, David clearly understood his original sin and his wickedness, and he quotes in Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He full well knew how wretched he was and that he had original sin. But he also knew, forwarding to Psalm 139, and this is the other half of the equation, Christ, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, in another verse it says um, that God concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. That's the same thing. Every man is condemned, as you've read and as you said. Every man is guilty and condemned. And the um, Pelagians and the, I don't know their names, the, um, and the men who they were um, arguing against in the Augsburg Confession, the Pelagians, uh, Pelagians, or whatever they were, <laughs> you might be able to say it. There were several of the, them. You know, the Anabaptists were also um, uh, those that said that, that, that little people, children, infants, do not have original sin. They've, and I buy um, milk from a guy that believes like that, that, that they're innocent until they start doing sins and start accruing sin. And I say, no, no, they have, they're filthy from head to foot, in and out because of original sin. However, they are redeemed in Christ. And this is the other half of the equation that I believe you're leaving out. Maybe you could comment on that. But it says here, in Psalm 139, it says, Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And this is the verse in particular. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! And he goes on even. And this is why David could look at his eight... Actually, his, his boy wasn't even eight days old, otherwise he would have been <coughs> named and, and circumcised. But he is seven days old, and that's why David could look at him and say, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And that's why Job... Oh, um, when Job was lamenting about his plight that he had fallen into and his wretchedness, Job said he wished that his, and that his um, mother's legs would have been closed that way. He would have never been born. He wished that and that he would have been prevented so that he could rest where the weary be at rest and the, um, and the wicked cease from <coughs> troubling. Because he knew that an infant's death is precious. Now, there's no reason to suspect that they're um, condemned or damned because their original sin is dealt with. That's all I'll say for now. Uh, with regard to sin and origin, actual sin flows from original sin. I, mean, I don't want to get into that uh, debate. I agree with what Bud said. I agree with what you said. I think we're, we're picking at nits or something there. But with regard to the law, Jesus made clear that the law is spiritual. Paul himself states that the law is spiritual. And that's the matter that we have to come to know. The law says don't commit adultery. And people say, well, I haven't slept with my neighbor's wife. I haven't committed adultery. But Jesus said, if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. If you are angry, you've committed murder. And that's the matter Jesus wants us to come to know. That we would see how bound we are in sin. That it's not just what we put our hand to that makes us sinners. It's the source of that. The inclinations of our heart that make us condemned. And that is the concupiscence we are born with. Now with regard to what David said, David was a child of God, truly. The children of God can write such things. But what you're saying is that there is original sin and children are filthy but without any means they become saved and scripture is against such a doctrine we know that without faith it is impossible to please God 
We know that we're justified by faith. Scripture says that. We know that children, infants, have faith. We believe that too. We know that. Scripture makes clear how faith comes. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be condemned, ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. There is a means of grace, and that is by the proclamation of the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ. And that's how the kingdom of God comes unto us. It is written uh, in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 9 of Baptism, And as we condemn most other errors of the Anabaptists, we condemn this also, that they dispute that baptism of little children is unprofitable. For it is very certain that the promise of salvation pertains also to little children, that the divine promise of grace and of the Holy Ghost belong not alone to the old, but also to children. Neither indeed does it pertain to those who are outside of Christ's church, where there is neither word nor sacraments, because the kingdom of Christ exists only with the word and sacraments. Therefore it is necessary to baptize little children that the promise of salvation may be applied to them according to Christ's command, baptize all nations. The important thing to note there is that there is a means of grace. And the Augsburg Confession makes that clear also. that we may obtain this faith. They're talking about their justifying faith. The office of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. For through the word and sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Ghost is given, who worketh faith where and when it pleaseth God in them that hear the gospel, to wit, that God, not for our own merits, but for Christ's sake, justified those who believe that, they're, that they are received into favor for Christ's sake. They condemn the Anabaptists and others who think that the Holy Ghost cometh, cometh to men without the external word through their own preparation and works. And it is written also in the formula of conquered this way. On the other hand, the enthusiasts should be rebuked with great severity and zeal and should in no way be tolerated in the church of God who fabricate that God without any means, without the hearing of the divine word and without the use of the holy sacraments, draws man to himself and enlightens, justifies, and saves him. Therefore, I teach that according to the doctrines of our church and according to scripture, that there is no salvation outside of the Christian church. But we who are children of God can be confident that the God who brought to us the gospel and who promises to be the God of our children applies the gospel of grace also to our children and saves them as well as us. Because the word and sacraments are among us, I have full and complete confidence in this. I hear people t wonder about babies. Well, we lost a child and some, you know, my somebody miscarried. I'm very familiar with these matters because I lost a child and my wife miscarried. But I have full trust in the word and promises of God that he who is my God, my Savior, and who promises to be the God of my children has also brought to them that same word. And because they are in this kingdom of grace, they too are saved and I will see them again. Yeah. Or, you can tell. What? If that's if that's the way you believe, then that's not the way you preach, though. You have full faith that God has brought the word to them, and then you preach in this congregation up from behind the pulpit that the children are born slaves of the devil. You don't have full confidence and faith that God's brought the word to the, their children, just yours? 
No, all who are in the Christian church, all, all every place where the word of God is preached. Well, then why keep bringing it up? It's not edifying. People are upset to keep bringing up statements like children are born of the devil or slaves of the devil. However, you've put it, I know you've put it different ways, at least three different ways I've heard. Um, I don't understand how you can sit there and say that you have full confidence and faith that God, through the word and the sacraments, saved your, your child that was miscarried and then can go up behind the pulpit and preach that. I just, it, it doesn't seem like it, they connect to me. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I just don't understand. It just doesn't seem like what you're saying there compared to what we hear preached is the same thing. The gospel is preached. It's for our children. I, I think we can trust that. I don't deny it to anybody. And again, if I could... If God would allow that, I could speak these matters of truth in a, in, a, in a better way. I beg that he would allow that to happen without me having to go preach through my head, through my, you know, reason. What does this sound like? What, it, it run everything through my mind, you know. It would be wonderful. Comment? Well, I think that nothing can enter heaven if the devil is more powerful. So if the children have not been covered by the blood of the lamb in the mother's womb, then they have to have gone to hell. And if you're covered by the blood of the lamb, then you are no longer a servant of the devil. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, you're right. But we needed the blood of the lamb, and need the blood of the lamb. But we needed at first the blood of the lamb because that is our natural, our natural constitution is corruption. Right. So in the womb, I, I fully agree that the womb is no barrier to the word of God, and I've said that. Right. Wherever a child is in the kingdom of God. But then they must not be under the power of Satan. According to the natural constitution, they, they were, are. And if we want to talk about at what point exactly it, it happens, leave that to the Holy Spirit, like Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it comes, whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. But the fact that according to our natural birth, according to our flesh, we need the blood of Jesus, we need a deliverer and Savior, that's the fact that, that what I'm trying, I guess I'm trying to get across. Let me just say this maybe I'm not saying it clear. I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I, 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 if you sorry. want to kick out a preacher, I mean, I'm, you know, as far as a preacher goes, I'd kick myself out. Well, I'm just saying as an adult, then, when we are under the blood of Christ, Satan has no more power over us. That's correct. When we are children of God, Satan has no more power. So the children are no longer under the power of the devil. They're, they have their flesh, but they're not under the power of the devil, or they would not be saved. If they're under the power of the devil, they can't be saved. I agree with that. But the gospel belongs to our children, too. Right. Ryan? Oh, you said Ryan. Ryan. Okay, I'll just gonna, I'll mention. May, may I just, yes, one, right. one thing to clarify, where, where Paul says, that the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband and the unbelieving husband wife. He said, else we are children unclean, but now are they holy. And he didn't make distinction of children in the womb or out of the womb. The children of the believing parent, where the word of God is, where the word of God is preached, are holy children. Not because of the parent's holiness, not because of the child's own holiness, but because of the word of God which sanctifies them. Well, what time then do, do we become unholy? What do you mean to become? Well, now you just said that the children were holy from the parents. Paul says the children of the believing parent. He said, I else were children unclean, but now are they holy? He didn't distinguish there. Leave the working of the Holy Ghost up to the Holy Ghost. 
So what would that be for hope? When does it stop, though? Because when the children go into the world, when does it stop? When does it stop? When are they no longer holy? If they're holy in the womb and saved, are they still holy if they've gone off into the world? Those who live in global sin, unrepentant, no, are not holy. But what have they done too? They've left the word. They've left the sanctifying word. They left the church. Um, I guess there are many different things on the table, but that particular text that you just mentioned is actually dealing with sanctification, not justification. And there is a huge difference. Um, a person is justified um, when Christ died for them. A person is sanctified when Christ is in them. And um, to get back to some you know, no, other I would answer that first. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Without having Christ within, we are not sanctified, we are not justified, neither. Neither of why. We must possess the spirit of Christ. But for an for infant now, um, when Christ is... Let me back up here. The, the word is both written and spoken. And, and I agree with everything you read out of the Oxford Confession on Romans 10 about the spoken word. The spoken word does create life within us, it convicts, it produces new birth, it, it converts us, it does all that for us. And there were men who, who disagreed. They said you know, that they can get new birth through other means and you know, whatever, osmosis for all we um, know about. But it doesn't come that way. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. However, regarding infants, being the word is a written word as well, they are written in his word. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we can look at this from this angle too. This is a good um, angle to um, look at this. Is that all the, all the names um, in the Book of Life, the only transaction that takes place, the only movement of those names goes from um, either in the Book of Life to blotted out. There's no names being added to it. And infants' names are written in the Book of Life. And on, on, on the killing sin is neglect of Christ. When a person's name is blotted out, it's no longer there. It's no longer written in there. And to prove this and to show this, and I can quote a few different verses, but one place that's real clear is the Psalms. Psalm 69. Psalm 69 speaks about, it's speaking about Christ on the cross, on it gave me gall for my meat and vinegar for my drink. And then it says that, it says, left their table, they gave me gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. So that's Christ for all, for all men, Jew, Gentile, Greek, Muslim, black, white, rich, poor, for all. And then a little bit further, it says, add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into this, come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So in other words, at this point they are in the book. All the despisers of Christ, all the everybody, all the all the Judases of the world, all the all the filth, but they can be blotted out. They can be blotted out. If God blots out a name, then it's out. But there's never any place where it says that they were they were added to it or were written in there. They're already written, but they can be blotted out. And that's why I say that infants are in the book. They're written in the book. And when it comes time, and this is another angle of it, I was going to start in Nehemiah where it speaks about, and this is why I believe God, God holds um, in, um, uh, infants in Christ. But I want to mention a few places, one from Nehemiah and then a few from Deuteronomy and then somebody else can come. You mean all infants in the whole world is that we refer to without regard to whether they're in the kingdom of God or not? Yeah, because Okay, so you don't agree with the doctrines of our church, so if no, you want I to do. go on from there, 
I, guess I do, but don't interrupt. I'll, I'll, I'll I just wanted to clarify what children you're talking about. I'm talking about Paul. I'll read from Rosinius too, where he says the same thing. So is that, is that what the argument is? Is whether um, all children are saved or just a what? Just a few? That's what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. my, my answer to that what we're talking is about where the word and sacraments are, there is salvation for everybody, babies too. So if I'm first, I'm going out of off. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay, I'll just read a few verses from, uh, one from Nehemiah chapter 8 and then a couple from Deuteronomy where God makes a differentiation between who hears and who doesn't and, and he, he says it this way. Um, I'm trying to make it too lengthy but it's got to get this said anyways. In Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday and, and before the men and women and those that could understand it. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And he makes a differentiation. There was some, in other words, there that couldn't hear with understanding. And he's not talking about necessarily, I mean, I, I I know it's a spiritual hearing too. There was many here that didn't actually hear what what Nehemiah and Ezra were you know, were speaking, but but he's talking about hearing with understanding. And then in Deuteronomy um, twenty, Deuteronomy one um, mentions it that God pardoned all the little ones, every single person uh, um, that was was on the Exodus way, they all perished in the wilderness other than Joshua and Caleb and all the little ones. And why was that? Because God didn't hold their, their sins. They had original sin all the way. They spunked and cried and disobeyed their parents and all that. They had original sin. They all made it into Canaan. And it says this way, this is how God beheld them. Moreover, your little ones which ye said sh should be a prey, and your children which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you, take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And then another place of Deuteronomy. I believe it's in 29, but it basically says the same thing. I mean, I don't want to take up too much time, but... Okay, and maybe call on somebody else. Well, he's going to can move on. I'll... Okay. Yeah. Andrew, Brian. I didn't have any. You didn't? Brian? No, I'm the list. Uh, Bob. <laughs> Did you well, why can't Ryan finish? Huh? I said, why well, can't I'll just Ryan kind finish? Of, I was finish. looking for a place. And was well, he said he was reading some more places. Uh, there. Well. That's Bob's turn. Yeah, last time I can't. Right, right. Yeah, just push Did you have something to say, Ray? No. Okay, and then Bob, your turn. Well, here's one place, uh, and I, this is a this is a discussion. I don't know. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a matter that shouldn't get beyond very many get very far even in a congregation. But this matter of children and uh, babies and babies, I want to say. Now, in Revelations, the 17th chapter, um, and this was um, it, 17th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. So there were names who were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, and that's what God's word says. Paul, the whole, the whole, the whole thing, uh, what's and the way it's come to light in the past is because there are a lot of issues that people find hard to grasp 
they don't like to hear children are born children of the devil. There's, and we know that it's written up in, in many of the writings, like, uh, like Doug has even mentioned and Luther, that there's certain things that should be put on the shelf. And I think that's, that's, that's wise uh, judgment there. That's, that's a wise saying. And the reason it's caused such a problem, and your name has come up associated with a lot of times, because you say it a lot. And it seems to be, a lot of times, a primary theme. And people are wondering, what, what, where is the edification in continually talking about this? You know, um, because they can't understand it like that. They're not used to hearing it like that. They have come from congregations. We are here, as in many congregations here, we are a melting pot of many, many different congregations. And a lot of them, um, they hold uh, as, as their dear brothers and preachers, you know, from even up in Michigan, we've had rotating ministers. Um, and, you know, we, we hear a lot of the Bible preached. Um, Wilfred is a good example of what I'm used to hearing. He's very good in instruction. He's very good in instruction in the Christian way, the Christian walk, um, and, and preaching Christ and preaching repentance. And that's, for me, that's all I've heard all growing up. So to hear something that goes off into, into those kind of topics, whether it be uh, infant salvation, children are born, children the devil, predestination, all of those things, and to hear a, a lot is like, I don't, you know, what's going on? You would hear a lot of predestination or children, children being lost, because I don't teach that children are lost, and that's a fine line, but where the word of God is not, I cannot say there's life and salvation for anybody. Do I say children go to hell necessarily then? No, but that's that's the inference that's made. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know. And that's what's causing a lot of the contention and a lot of the problem. How, you know, how could we address original sin? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to yield I'm open, open yeah. to well, instruction. Uh, some of the questions, it seems like, now we have to say that which is born of flesh is flesh. A natural man cannot be a partaker of the matters of salvation and of faith. I mean, is that agreed and understood? So we are all born, as it says, without, the, without fear of God and without tr trust in God in our carnal nature. That's what we're speaking of. And I don't know how, how it could be such a problem. I can't, I can't understand it. How it can be such a problem to, under, to come to understand it because that's how it surely is. Brian? No, man, comes up. Understand original sin, commandments, law. Comes to know that he's, as these brothers have testified, so has been my experience in life. Um, God's word will do the work. Let's preach the word. I think that that will do it. I really do. The the with God rightly dividing the word, it's going to reveal what actual sin is, and it's going to bring us right down that we're born in original sin. That's the only way it's going to happen. We hear a lot in the, uh, and this is the way it's been talked to me by numerous people in that, and it's like, we seem to hear a lot of, you know, about our nature, the evil inclination of man, Know, the, the struggle we have with the devil, and there's, there's nothing we can do over ourselves. We seem to hear a lot of that. But, you know, when somebody comes in, an outsider or a called minister or whatever comes in, and they speak about instruction in the walk of a Christian, you know, to repent and put away those things that, that trouble us, and what a Christian has to do, that's why, in the way I see I see it. That's why there is such a drawing to those ministers because it's like, this is what I can do. I've always heard, you know, there's nothing I can do, and it's left at that. 
you know, what's the next step? The gospel. And the gospel. What Christ has done for us. What Christ has that done was for us. My but, but it's, it's, you know, then there's like, oh, here's what I can do. When somebody gets up there and says, I want to speak to the teenagers. I want to, I want to speak to the young, right? And they're pre preaching about sin and certain sins in that it's like somebody is going to, somebody's going to be sitting there and saying, you know, that's, that's true a, and all that. And others are going to be sitting there and saying, why is he preaching at me? Yeah. You know, that's good instruction. So that's, that's the whole, a lot of, a lot of problem, not maybe the whole problem. That's a lot of problem. I got Ryan Lampin and then Gene, and not Ryan Temple. First, I'd like to um, I'll mention, go back to that verse that Bob quoted. That seemed to have put a, um, a wrench in what I had said about the Book of Life. However, um, when it says that way, um, first of all, the Word of God is not going to speak against itself. So everything that we're, and that the Bible speaks about the Book of Life doesn't get dumped on its side because of that verse. Um, just to reiterate that verse, it says, it says, uh, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, comma, it's not wondering, it's not that they're wondering whose names are written in the Book of Life, but those that are wondering at the beast, those that are adoring the beast, their names, it says, whose names were not written in the Book of Life from the foundation of the world. The foundation of the world is to be understood this way. Um, it says in, um, in Revelations 13, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's, that's um, the foundation of the world is dealing with. Not that, that there were some names that weren't written and some names that were added to it. No, the names are written, but the Bible says that the exchange or the the movement of names can only go in one direction. They go out. They either stay in or they, or they get blotted out. That's the exchange of names. Um, the other point I wanted to make about, about how Rosinius understood, and, and this volume three is an excellent, excellent um, volume for dealing with the universal gospel, Christ for all. Um, almost every sermon in here deals with it on some um, manner or another, but this is a real, real easy to understand one. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just, just little snippets from it. The verse is, His grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And he goes on how we should be. That Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And we see that our eternal election of grace is not based on any indulgent love on the part of God, because iniquity had to be atoned for transgression to be taken away, sin had to be covered, and eternal righteousness had to be brought in. It was not based on any deserving virtue or worthiness on our part. And we're speaking of that all tonight. You know, we know it's not of our own works. But what we're saying is it's for all. And Rosinius um, um, goes on to say that he wanted a redemption for all. In this last couple paragraphs, um, I'll read in its entirety because it kind of uh, wraps it up. Um, this is the general election of grace in Christ comprising all mankind on the earth because according to God's intent, nobody is excluded. In Romans 3 and Romans 5 and Romans 8, I'll um, deal with this extensively, but we don't have time to get into all those. Nobody is excluded. God wants to have all human beings saved. And solemnly, he, ex he himself professes, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, that was Ezekiel, this is Timothy. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter, he is the savior of all human beings. That's a partial quote from Timothy. Therefore Christ commanded his apostles, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Thus there is no difference. There is no special individual, no special people or kindred on the earth has been chosen, but this election is general comprising all kindreds and all people, 
Jews, Gentiles, Turks, Christians, Catholics, Lutherans, in short, all people, wicked and good, faithful and unfaithful, godless and pious, rich and poor, high and low, men and women, in one word, the whole of mankind, all who, under, all who are under heaven. So reads the proclamation of eternal election of grace. And in thy seed, which is Christ, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That's dealing with justification. Gene, you are next. Well, I was just going to mention, personally, I'm thankful that this is a peaceful meeting. <laughs> you know, really, I don't think any of us here tonight understand the depth of what is before us. You know what we're really talking about tonight is the integrity of the church. Do we believe that the church is the bride of Christ? Do we believe that? No. If we believe that, what we're accomplishing tonight, if we're putting on trial the blood of Jesus. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross, do you remember what he did? As they were slaying him, he's praying for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If this church, this Bride of Christ, is going to be so confusing, what I've heard tonight, it's one, okay, it's one thing if someone leaves the church because of the preaching of sin and their whatever. It's another thing when someone leaves the Bride of Christ because of confusion in the church. That is so critical and so important I don't care Steve or whoever, each one of us who have ever preached, we need to hang our head in shame tonight. These matters shouldn't even really be before us. You read all the way through Acts when Peter and Paul and all those preached. There was no concern about predestination, about babies, about this, but their question came up after Paul says, you've murdered the Son of God. They asked, what must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. That's what the Bride of Christ is preached, should be preaching. This is absolutely unbelievable to me. I cannot believe it. And we wonder why people are leaving the church. We wonder why people are seeking something else. If they aren't offered Christ crucified in, in its entirety and everything that comes with it. You know, Rosinius, in, in that same book, on the 18th, he says, be of one mind. He has a strong admonition that each one of us have to pay careful attention to. He says in there, though, a man was to have the greatest revelation from God himself, and he brings it to the church, and he's going to demand that the church observe this revelation, and he offends one little one, or... He offends a weak brother in faith who Christ has died for. Rosinius said that it would have been better if he would have kept that to himself his entire day because that blood will be required of him. We must be very careful how we preach and what we preach. It shouldn't be a gray matter. These things should not even be before us. We should be preaching Christ crucified. Repent and be saved. That's what they were told to do. Repent and be baptized. They weren't concerned about children, whether they were saved or not. They were concerned about the repenting and the remission of sins. That's what this church, that's what the Bride of Christ should do. It's united around Jesus. And when someone comes in and begins to break that union, union woe unto that man. Woe unto him. That's all I can say. May God have mercy. About and I can promise one more thing. This church will not see an awakening until we resolve this thing. Until it's resolved. It will not. Because you know why? Tonight, Christ is over in the sanctuary. He's not in here with us. I beg to differ. I don't believe it. We've put him over there because we're too busy talking about everything else. And I think that's what people are seeing. You know, we've had a lot of confrontations in Hawkinson. I asked one of the board members about eight years ago. 
We've had many couples who have left. I said, you guys, you form a lot of committees. I said, have you formed a committee to see why these people are leaving? They go, well, no. I said, you should. Have you guys done that? Have you went and sought those who have left and found out why they have left? I mean, really, from the heart, find out why they have left. This is what we need to be doing. That's how I see it. I'm sorry. That's just how I see it. Well, I was just going to say, in all fairness, that Buddy, Buddy has tried to talk to all the people that have left. That's excellent. Well, <clears throat> I did likewise out there. And it was amazing some of the answers I got. Totally unexpected. Because everybody's labeled, when they leave, they're labeled, you know. Generally how we do it. Well, we have to preach the law and the gospel, and um, I guess the question then is, how is the law preached and how is the gospel preached? We have a lot of good examples in the scripture. The word. The yeah. word is all encompassing, that's for sure. Yeah. But I think uh, he has something to say. Oh. Hmm. It's, I think it would be very beneficial to read what Luther says of the assurance of this pure doctrine, which is essential. In the first place, therefore, it is necessary that both preachers and hearers take heed to doctrine, have clear, unmistakable evidence that what they embrace is really the true word of God, revealed from heaven. A doctrine given to the holy and primitive fathers, prophets, and apostles, the doctrine Christ himself confirmed and commanded to be taught. We are not permitted to employ the teaching dictated by any man's pleasure or fancy. We may not adopt, adapt the word to mere human knowledge and reason. We are not to trifle with the scriptures, to juggle with the word of God, as if it would admit of being explained to suit the people, or of being twisted, distended, and patched to affect peace and agreement among men. Otherwise, there would, should, there would be no sure permanent foundation whereon the conscience might rely. I, I agree uh, with what Gene's saying, and I think it's something to seriously consider. Um, We're dealing with the consciences of men. And I think we're, we're like way over here above the people. I'm hearing that. Souls of men? Yeah, souls of men. We're dealing with the souls of men. Life and death. Are we speaking of the, the Pharisee as that man over there, that man over there? Or is it here? When we speak of it, do we speak of it? It's right here. Are we really the sinner, or is everybody else the sinner? Things to consider. I'll tell you, we read in uh, Ezekiel, and it talks about the blood that's going to be on our hands. If we don't, as watchmen, as we see the sin amongst us and wrong teachings amongst us, that blood's going to be on our hands. What we say is going to be on our hands, that blood. Of the people and us. That's not going to be a very nice eternity. Oh, God, help us. Well, I was just going to mention, you know, I, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was 14 when we started being taken to church by one of my aunts. My parents came through... Uh, my mother was... She said she was never a Christian, but she was raised in a, per se, a Christian home. 
buy a moral home for sure, and so was I. Well, my parents went through a time, I couldn't even begin to tell you the turmoil that was in our house when my mom and dad, my mom was first awakened. And I guess the point I want to make is when my mother died, she couldn't have told you what sanctification meant. She couldn't have told you what justification meant. She probably couldn't have quoted you three verses out of the Bible consecutively. She knew a lot of songs. But you know what? When she died, she saw angels and she saw Jesus. She had been in a coma for 12 hours. She awoke and she saw all this. And she was telling us about it. And she was telling, the only thing that stuck in my mind, she, over and over again, she says, thank you, Jesus, for your long suffering for me. That's what she saw.